on the next episode of Star Talk. It's a Cosmic Queries featuring the expertise of a colleague of mine from Princeton University. The name is Gaspar Bakush, and he is at the Department of Astrophysics there, where he has developed a system of small telescopes to discover exoplanets. So we're going to find out how does that work? Why does a small telescope still get to contribute to a field that's on the frontier? And we also learn how these satellite trails that we've read all about and seen videos of launched from rockets and how they affect the data that he's searching for, as well as the beauty and majesty of the night sky that we've all missed ever since cities have become electrified. All coming up on Star Talk. This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. And this is yet another Cosmic Queries edition. This one, we solicited questions from our Patreon members on topics such as the search for exoplanets, the telescopes that discover them, but also what is happening to our night sky and the new kind of light pollution, satellites trailing across the heavens. I got with me Matt Kirsch and Matt, my co-host. How you doing, man? I'm, I'm very good. I'm, I'm excited about this topic, not least because um, a couple of weeks ago, as a birthday present from my wife, I went to Mount Wilson Observatory for a a lecture and then a look through the big telescope. Very good, very good. Yeah, so so I, I I'm I feel like I'm I'm up at an amateur level now on this, but I want to hear from the pros. Ex excellent, excellent. So what, what, it, the, what? There are people who are experts in all of the things I listed. One of whom is actually uh, just across the river, across the moat here. We call it the Hudson River over in New Jersey. Uh, is a colleague of mine from Princeton Department of Astrophysical Sciences, Gaspar Bakos. Gaspar, welcome to Star Talk. Yes, hi everyone. I'm I'm glad to be here. Excellent, excellent. And you are a, a PI on a project called Hatnet, which is search for exoplanets. Uh, and of course, people. I don't think everyone thinks much about the fact that at any given spot on Earth, uh, where most people live, you don't see the whole sky. So if you're going to find exoplanets in a place you're not looking, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So, um, indeed, there is a project called HeadNet, which is uh, which is an automated telescope system. Uh, because finding exoplanets with the naked eye would be really very challenging. I would say impossible. <laughs> um, but um, the idea behind behind robotic telescopes is they can actually scan, uh, monitor big areas of the sky nonstop, and then we can use computers to analyze all the data. And we can place these robotic telescopes to like uh, fancy astronomical locations, which have clear skies, high mountains, and have internet and power. That's getting very difficult. <laughs> and they're not very large, so it's not a big disruption to the physical location. Where you oh put yeah, them, they're, correct. They're they're actually tiny. This is a this was an amazing thing that um, we realized about sort of twenty years ago that that we can actually do cutting edge science with tiny telescopes. Um, um, because stars, when a planet goes in front of them, they blink, and that blink can be detected with a small telescope if it's all carefully engineered and, and run. So, right, right, uh, but HatNet, you apparently, it's not. You have telescopes in multiple places on Earth, and why why did you do that? Oh yeah, so um, the the transits are elusive, and and the, and the transit of a planet that the time instance when it goes in front of its star. Um, will have nothing to do whether it's daytime or nighttime on Earth from a given location. So it might actually go in front of its star and the star blinks when it's broad daylight here in Princeton. Um, so the idea is to put telescopes around the globe uh, at tactical longitudes so we can observe around the clock. In other words, the sun never rises above our telescope empire. Um, uh -huh. never set. <laughs> it also never sets. <laughs> it, it never. It never sets. It that's depends. equivalent. <laughs> this whole British Empire. That's the sun never <laughs> sets. It never rises either. But logically, it also never rises. But yeah. okay, so so you can cover it. So you've got. I love your phrase, tactical longitudes. Uh, but now, what about latitude? Um. Yeah, you can also be tactical with latitudes because here's the thing: if you go too far to the south, you freeze to death. And I don't like that. If you go too close to the equator, then you have 
too much humidity and jungles, which are, are lovely things, but it's just not good for astronomy. Well, too far south if you're in the southern hemisphere. If right? you're in the south, in the north, right. it's the same thing. I mean, and plus in the north, if you go too far north, there's no, no ground. You can, yes. you can <laughs> attach to it. That's another problem. So, yeah, mo uh, most people don't know that Santa Claus lives on an ice floe. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Most illustrations of Santa Claus at his, his workshop, they have mountains and tree, you know, pine trees and things. It's like, no. No. So that's worrying. With, with with climate change, he could like it could disappear. He could end yeah, up. This would swimming be sad. In... Yeah, this would be Santa Claus in a bathing suit, right, just sitting there on a float. <laughs> well, All it's right. already happening. Last year, the the Arctic did not freeze over. It was mm, in the news. Okay, Sh yeah. sh ships can be crossing it at any time or something. So it's like. So where are your t where are your Southern Hemisphere telescopes? Where are they? Um, so the first station we built is in Chile at Las Campanas Observatory in the mm -hmm. in the Andes. So it's um, a pre existing observatory location yeah. right so you yeah. you yeah. didn't have to build roads you didn't have to put in the internet like you said you just ride the pre-existing infrastructure yeah exactly but we did pour the concrete beers we pulled in a container like a, a shed for uh, instruments and we hold in all the things and build the whole infrastructure up for our local installation but there is other infrastructure already there um the second one is in namibia in the kalahari desert there is an existing installation there called the Hess, um, Hess Telescopes. Um, so again, we had um, internet, we had power, um, sort of. You know, it was um, <laughs> it, it was uh, a bit uh, tough in the beginning, um, but it's an amazing place. Um, and the third one is in Australia in the outback at Siding Spring Observatory, okay. which again has sort of very good infrastructure. All right, well, very cool. And the last I checked, the the catalog of exoplanets was nicely rising through 5,000. And uh, you're going to make predictions about how soon we'll hit maybe 10,000, doubling that number? Yeah, that's a that's a, that's a very hard thing to extrapolate. Right, let me um, ask a different question. At what rate yeah. are you discovering exoplanets? That, I, um, yeah, yeah. Well, what's, yeah. Are you good at this? <laughs> yeah. Well, so our rate, we actually found 140-something exoplanets between 2006 and now, and our rate has been going down because uh, space missions have been contributing majority of the discoveries. Um, but, you know, space missions have a limited lifetime. So Kepler was a famous one that flew from 2009 through sort of 18. Um, and then TESS is now a highly productive mission, which will run for a limited time. And oh, TESS is itself a an acronym. What is it? Transit Transiting Exoplanet uh, Survey, Survey Satellite. Satellite. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. So so I've been fascinated by this. So so but you'll continue cranking with or without the space observatories, is what you're saying. Well, an idea of what we do is we complement the the data coming from space. Let's say TESS observes um, an area for 27 days uh nonstop and it finds transiting planets. Now some of the transits will be single transits. There will be just a blip in the light curve. And we don't know what's when the next blip is happening. We don't know. And But if we complement it with ground-based data, we can solve for the period. And oh, then, excellent. Then so the, can, so yeah. TESS makes the discovery. Now you follow up to verify that it's that it's a repeating phenomenon. Because yes. if they just see one blip, well, that could have been anything. Oh, yeah. Know, right? Yeah. And there's many false positives. That's the other thing that there's 5,000 planet candidates right now. But... I think the number of confirmed planets with mass is measured, say, is about 270 from TESS. So there's like a huge difference between um, okay. between the two. All right, so it's still a lot of work to, to happen there. So now you're also involved in, you're, you're a part of a documentary called Dark Sacred Night. That's, yep. that's some powerful words there. So what's going on with that? Well, I've been, uh, I, I grew up on the dark skies as a kid. I... Um, was that the moon? I, where, where, did you, where did you have dark skies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, ISS, it's almost. He was, um, he was an ISS kid. He was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were on an astronaut. Yeah. Okay, yeah, fess up to us. Where where were you when you grew up? Uh, I I grew up in the northeast part of Nigeria on the border oh, wow. of Cameroon. Oh my gosh! Um, on on a farm, and there oh, was there it is. There it is. That's the, yeah, that's the there was there was no electricity and uh, no TV, no no internet, no phone, <laughs> but but we had the dark the, the dark sky, and it was really amazing. Um, I remember as a five year old looking up, and I would see the Milky Way going down to the fence or whatever the horizon, you know, and um, and then I realized when we moved back to Europe that this is. This is not something I see from there, um, and especially at all. not from... at all. Yeah, it's not even oh, you yeah. don't even know it's there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just 
on the two, like all that beauty is sort of uh, missing for, I felt pity for, for all of us here that we, we just don't see this thing. And I felt, uh, is it actually a necessity or is it a stupidity? And after a while, I realized it is more of a stupidity. Um, if, if lights were properly designed and named down, it was not wasted, then we would actually see the Milky Way from the majority of the so US. So we have both civilization plus a dark night sky is what so, you're saying. So not having our Absolutely, cities any less yeah. in it, but just yeah. having smarter lighting that is less wasteful, less less pointing up and escaping less. Matt, I mean, you know what I tell people when I'm, I'm in an airplane and we're about to do our final loop to the airport yeah. around a city? I, I'd say to the person next to me, you see that that area of street lights down there? And they say, yeah. And, and I say, someone is paying money to send <laughs> photons to me in an airplane. <laughs> it is doing no good for yeah. whatever their well, purpose is down on, on, on the I mean, the, the estimate now is um, something like 50% of the light emitted in the U.S. by light fixtures goes up straight in the sky. Mm. And that's pure geometry. They are not shielded. It's like not, not rocket yeah. science. It's like <laughs> the simplest <laughs> thing. And the amount of money, which just Neil referred to, is right now the estimate is about $3 billion per year is converted into photons that <laughs> to, go up just in to space light clouds. simply because of a poor design. Just, just to light, light clouds. clouds and airplanes we, so we can I've see the I've talked about this before yeah, on, yeah, on this show, yeah. but it because I grew up on the outskirts of London and then now I live in Los Angeles and Neil, you grew up in New York and it's just, I, the, I remember the first time I was somewhere that was sort of remote and in the middle of nowhere and you could really see the sky and I was like, oh, that's what stars are. That's what people used to write poems about and draw yeah, pictures so, of. So Matt, that moment for me was in the Hayden Planetarium. <laughs> Oh, is that what the sky looks like? <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? So, so Matt, you wow. uh, this is a hybrid, nice conversation with our guests, but also we solicited questions from our audience. So, uh, Matt, what questions do you have for, we absolutely uh, for did. our man here? Yeah, so a bunch, a load of Patreon patrons came through with some great questions. So Shane McDaniel says, when you use long exposure detectors, how do you keep them in the same line of sight through the exposure? So that all the data lines up, given the Earth is rotating, nice, and the cameras good, in space have yeah. their own velocity. Um, I don't know if this refers to a space mission or or a ground-based telescope, but whatever it is, we have developed tracking on the skies. Has been on on Earth. We have what we call the polar axis of all sky telescopes. You'll see on big axis pointed at the roughly the North Pole, which is Polaris at our time, and the telescope spins around this with what we call sidereal rate. And we also have other fine things like the auto guide. We have a special detector, which is sensing starlight and would like nudge the motors left and right to keep things exactly in the center. And for a space mission, it's um, similar techniques. They have gyroscopes, they can orient. And plus in, in space, it's, uh, it's somewhat easier actually to, to track because you know, you have less external forces. You are not necessarily like spinning with the earth itself. So you're pointed at some direction. And you have yeah, to just, compensate and just to for add this. some emphasis there, you mentioned uh, sidereal time because I don't know that people know that the stars revolve around the Earth, if I may speak in that way, pre-Copernican. They revolve at a different rate than the sun does. So the sidereal rate is the star rate that the suns go around, the stars go around the Earth, and that's every twenty-three hours and fifty-six minutes. Um, yes, the that's stars true. make one complete loop. Whereas the sun makes one complete loop in 24 hours. So yeah, so we got smart people figuring all that out. But you know what what my iPhone does today is if I want to take a long exposure, it doesn't it doesn't say hold it really steady while I can do this. No. It takes multiple exposures, multiple short exposures, and then in software, when the exposure is done, it registers the light in that image, stacks them, adds them, and that's my final photo. And I don't even see the the intermediate stages of it. So, Gaspar, what you're saying is we know enough about the rotation of the Earth to compensate for it when we're taking long exposure photos. Yeah, yeah. We have measured the spin of the Earth very well, so well that we actually even see that's not something we correct for during the night. But strictly speaking, we see when the Earth spins down or spins up due to changing <laughs> seasons. So that's we really... That's really badass. To the... that, that's just totally bad. We we are so good at knowing the rotation of the Earth, we can say when it's varying. That's just that's yep. that's that's that you're showing off now. <laughs> I mean, think about the Earth used to be our primary <laughs> clock, right? Earth, and yep. you wouldn't yep. know if the clock was varying 
if your clock itself was the foundation of your timekeeping. So now you have to be able to keep time better than Earth does to then show that Earth is either speeding up or slowing down. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Rate. That crazy, crazy. So Matt, what, what do you have for our guest? Well, I, I'm going to combine a couple of questions because I'd love to do that. So there's a question from Mark Bode, firstly from Boulder, Colorado, who says, a question about the proliferation of low Earth orbit satellites. Since it doesn't seem like the rate humanity is launching these things will reduce anytime soon, what is the best way we can ensure the skies remain clear and free of light pollution to enable important activities such as the search for extrasolar planets? And then also Kevin Browning from White Deer, Texas says, how does low, or low orbiting satellites and space debris interfere with the search for exoplanets? What can ordinary people like myself who care about the night sky do to convince Congress or companies like SpaceX to reduce light pollution and the number of orbiting satellites. Okay, so so that's why you have to answer that in three sentences. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, actually, I'll... actually, first, why don't you distinguish for us the difference between light pollution and satellite pollution? Because it's not the same thing, is it? Yeah, um, there are some subtle bits here. Uh, I would say light pollution has a ground-based component, which is bright city lights, poorly designed lights, going up in the sky and, and illuminating our atmosphere and the night sky, making it brighter. And the second component, which is fairly new and unexpected, so to say, is light pollution coming from um, thousands or soon maybe tens of thousands of artificial satellites orbiting the Earth, reflecting back light from the sun or emitting radio waves, um, which is also electromagnetic radiation. So a form of light, are, yes. It's a form, form of, of light. light. So these are the, these are the two components. Um, the, to deal with the first one, I would say technically it's sort of a trivial thing, and yet we're not doing it. And there are many other things in the history of humanity which were trivial, and we have not been dealing with it. <laughs> so this is another example of that. Um, okay. But you know, to give some hope, I think some of them were dealt with. So we used to pollute our rivers far more than we do now. We used to pollute our atmosphere with freon and with other pollutants that would decrease smokestacks like, would you yeah. know I, I grew up where i have to brush ash off my shoulders because <laughs> yeah. every apartment building burned its own trash and at certain yeah. times of day so yeah when i grew I mean, up the, the sky was yeah. was bad for multiple reasons yeah so you know london used to be covered in soot for centuries and now it's sort of clean compared to that but yep, light the pollution really used to stink yeah light pollution which is basically shielding all the lights aiming them down where they are supposed to be lighting and dimming them to proper levels and not over lighting. This is it. And it has not been achieved. It's mm -hmm. like it's just stunningly bad. Um, and I'm really amazed that this is still going on under, you know, there's definitely a trend and, and a recognition of going green and being less pollutant. And yet we're wasting like $3 billion a year on lighting up the sky, which is very harmful for us. It's not about the stars, by the way, you know, it's this, this thing of, Yes, we want to see the stars, but it's about our own health, which has been now clearly detected to be very, very bad for our health, having strong ambient nighttime lighting. It's very bad for, for nature, for ecosystems, and even bad actually for safety. But that's a different topic. As for the night, uh, going back to the question, uh, the satellites um, up in the sky, um, that's, that's a hard problem to solve. Um, the problem is that the sun reflects back from these satellites and they are sort of useful in broadcasting internet. Now, almost everyone in the US has relatively broadband internet, um, if you think. Like there are 10 million people in New York, no one complains about having no internet. So that's providing them with another internet is really about business and it's not about like saving the world. Um, there are some parts of the, of, of the earth where um, internet is very poor. Um, say in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the desert, but there are very few people there. And historically, these people have been, if needed, have been using satellite phones for emergency communications. Um, there have been some efforts in dimming the satellites, painting them black, they overheated, putting them in a sun visor, which reflects light in a different direction. I think one idea is to have a smart design of satellites, being very, very conscious about the light reflected back. And to have strong limits on the number of satellites through agencies and, and regulations and by 
essentially updating the International Space Treaty, which is so outdated that majority of it is from the 1960s and 70s, um, completely unprepared for an, an wealthy individual launching his own satellites in numbers of thousands. You know, there's nothing in a space treaty like that. So it is a crazy situation that there is some treaty that is, have general policies about what we can use satellites for, you know, no warfare, you can't, you know, things like that. Um, and there was some ideas about like, you know, the Soviet Union was concerned about America broadcasting TV over the Soviet Union in the 1970s. That was basically the last major update of the space treaty. Um, I think there is a risk of a runaway process that, that companies will start competing um, for the number of satellites and trying to get to even broader bandwidth and shorter um, response time. Um, and so it might it might grow into the tens and hundreds of thousands, if not limited by some central agencies. So, so that peace treaty came from, out of the United Nations. It has a much longer title, if I remember, something like a treaty for the peaceful use of outer space. It's got some long title, which is very ho hopeful at the time. But I, I agree, it's, it's, it's now, you know, 50 years out of date, practically. And yeah, we, it's, uh, it's got, it needs to be modernized. And, and and many countries signed it, right? So it was a it was it had good intent at the time, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. there's no real agency at the moment who would say, um, you know, there's there's agencies who 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 let these tens of thousands of satellites to be launched, and the decision is essentially based on radio waves and um, orbital elements, but there is no environmental element in the consideration saying, no, guys, you can't do this. You can't paint the Hudson River red. Uh, it's <laughs> not yours. You can't put anything in the sky. It's not yours. Yeah, so our crack team of researchers dug up the full title of the treaty. I've got it here. I'll read it. The Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space, Including the Moon and Other Celestial Bodies. See, they needed astronomers in there to make a good acronym. Right. That's yeah. They need, <laughs> do you guys call it the Tapukase? <laughs> There's definitely some really dodgy space acronyms as well, where they've just taken letters from the middle of the word as well. Like you can't do that. It's got to be <laughs> the starting not allowed. letter. Not allowed. All right. All right. Really good answer there. That gives us much deeper insight into what's going on and what the challenges are, and how hard the solution might be. Uh, but God's where you said it's really just human stupidity for half of the problem. But, but let me add, so let me get back to one of the specific points of the question. Satellites trailing across the sky, does that affect your data taking when you're trying to discover an exoplanet? Big time, it does. Um, I actually see the trend in my own data now. Um, essentially, every image I take during the night, I would say up to three hours after sunset and from three hours before sunrise, Every image I take anywhere in the sky will have at least one trail or more. And those trails cross stars. And so the light of that star, when I measure, will have a big bump in it or some noise. So wow. it becomes mm -hmm. like an intense noise filtering. Now, some people say, oh, if you add, co -add all these images in a smart way, then the satellite trails will disappear. Yeah, but I don't co -add them. I'm trying to measure individual images and all right. the brightness of all the stars. So it's a it's yeah, a To co-add, that's, that's lingo for... We assume every picture you're taking is of the same thing. So yeah. now you take them and find out one of them has this weird streak. It's clearly, yeah. The, you drop that out, and then everything else is fine. But if one of the pictures contains something you need, and that's the one that gets dropped out, you lose your data. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Am I right in yeah. thinking one of the things you're looking for is specifically a change in the image when something when a planet crosses the star? Yes, precisely. I mean, there last time I was I was in Chile a couple of months ago, I, I let my camera, like my astrophotography equipment out to take a time lapse. And what I saw on this video in the morning uh, when I reviewed it was I showed this, saw this bright shooting star that's being crossed by another shooting star. And I said, this is remarkable. I have this photograph of two shooting stars crossing. And then came another like 500 on the horizon. <laughs> this is a regular DSLR you know, end user camera on a tripod. 
And literally, there was like a shower of satellites on the horizon from Chile. And I'm not hundreds, but more. It looked scary. Um, Matt, the, these are the these are the alien invasion that he's not telling us about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it looked, it looked well, like we, that. It looked like that. Yeah, it looked like the aliens. We were coming. did see when we were up at Mount Wilson. There was um, I guess is it Starlink? Is it that the Musk satellites? But there were there was a sudden trail of about ten, maybe more satellites mm-hmm. in a row just crossing the sky in a straight line and it did look it looked very alien invasion like to me it was just <laughs> i've never seen yeah, there a are... series of a series of things moving in a direct straight line and it's also <laughs> a cultural thing there are simulations showing how it will look like if it does proceed as it is now essentially it will be very hard to point out for example for a child where is the big dipper there will be all these moving bright dots <laughs> and in, in between that thing when you see that the thing that's not moving in it would be actually so confusing it's so um... we need a video game shooting down the satellites that's right so you can <laughs> see that uh, one thing i forgot to mention forgive me um so matt you went to mount wilson observatory which was the observatory that edwin hubble used edwin the hubble the man not the telescope used to discover that our Milky Way is not alone among galaxies in the universe and to discover that the universe is expanding. And so did they finally get that as a landmark? I think they wanted, because it's a I, landmark in our I, understanding of our place in the universe. I don't know what, what what's its official designation is, but they're certainly, they make a big deal of that and they're very proud of that. And it's yeah, pretty of course. cool to look through the same, the same telescope that Hubble looked through. It was, exactly. it was very, it was pretty impressive to go, oh, this is, this is where, as they put it uh, in the talk, like that they discovered the universe essentially here. In yeah, that yeah, sense. That, that's correct. That's correct. Well, give me some more questions. See if we can get one in before the break. Absolutely. So, um, Augustine from Puerto Rico, who is the host of the Curios- Curiosidad Scientifica podcast, on which I believe Neil has guested, talking about the Arecibo Observatory. I, I have. And, 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 and try to improve your Spanish the next time you read that, okay? Yeah, that was a. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I took a I took a very quick run at that and I was that was hoping serious to skip past gringo unnoticed, Spanish but that was that was, gringo that was, Spanish that was right poor there. and I I was hoping it would be missed but it was <laughs> okay. not Neil did not <laughs> didn't let that one slide but so, Augustine asks can an exoplanet have life like us on a binary star or red dwarf oh I love that love that okay you, yeah great. guess what are you thinking about life on the planets you're you're looking for? yeah oh yeah uh-huh. yeah I I think it's a fascinating topic um and um. I think the first uh, sort of written record of someone contemplating about it is is from a- ancient Greece, but there's also Hyhens in the um, 18th century um, pondering about all the stars being suns and why not they have, they have planets and why some planets actually are like the Earth. And he actually writes in his, there's a work, Cosmo Theoros, where he writes like, and there must be all these alien civilizations on these planets, and some of them might be intelligent and looking back at us. So it was really ahead of his time. This is the Dutch astronomer uh, Christian Huygens. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah, yes. Exactly, uh-huh. exactly. I think he published his book sort of to say posthumous, just to make sure he's not burnt on uh, some uh, stake or something. Uh, uh, um, but speculating I, I, about life in the universe, yeah. Yeah. yeah if, if, if the universe is divine because God created it, and we are the divine creation of God, you would not expect to find life anywhere else but Earth. Yeah. So this is quite yeah. heretical. Yeah. Now we know that there are, I would, the estimates vary over time because we're refining it, but there's basically about 20% of solar type stars have a planet that's rocky. So it's not like a helium or hydrogen giant that's rocky like the Earth and is in what we call the habitable zone. So if you multiply the 400 billion stars, in our galaxy, you take, there's about 40 billion of them similar to the sun, and then you multiply that by 0.2, that's about 8 billion um, rocky habitable planets just in our own galaxy. That's, that's a clear, lot of real estate. The math you're doing in, on the fly there is you're multiplying big numbers by fractions, right? Normally yeah. when we think of multiplying numbers, we make them bigger. So I just want to clarify, you're, you're taking the fraction of the 400 billion and yep. the fraction of what remained and then you, as you hack away at the large numbers, you get the numbers that have all the features that you're looking for. Yeah. Which is still yeah, a massive I think, number. I think yeah. it's an interesting thing if you look up at the Milky Way, which is lost for 99% of Americans. But if you actually happen to go to one of the national parks or travel far, you look up at the Milky Way, what's the probability of someone looking back at you? 
I think that's a fun <laughs> question, which we don't know the answer to yet. Mm -hmm. That's a little creepy, though. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but, but Gaspar, we left out a part of that question, which was, what percent might be orbiting a, a binary star? Oh, I see. Yes, that was indeed um, part of the question. So um, first of all, just to give a tiny introduction, we actually did not know that there are stable planets around binary stars. So meaning there's a, two stars orbiting each other very close in, and there's a planet far out orbiting this binary star. It was only in Star Wars. Tatooine is the only one. But then yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Kepler Space Telescope discovered 16 of them or something like that. So now wow. we know they exist, and we also know that some might be in what we call the habitable zone. So the probability is, is also exists, but these planets are much less frequent than the ones we that around normal stars. So Right, so um, I guess the, the point there that you imply is that if that planet were orbiting closer to the binary star, the orbit would become less stable because it would get yeah. really close to one star and then far from the other. But if you're far enough away... It just sees kind of one average gravity field. Is that a yeah. fair way to describe it? That's a fair way of describing it. And if it's very far away, it feels one gravity field, but it does not feel heat anymore. So oh, you get yeah. freezing. Okay. <laughs> so okay. you want to be in, in, in the right place. Um, so for a binary star, that's somewhat more limited. And I don't have an, an exact number. I don't think anyone does, but we are closing in on that number by... First of all, knowing the frequency of planets around binary stars or getting a handle on it. And and in the future, I think we will soon learn about what fraction of them are in this habitable zone. What we... and, and I'll just add that most of the stars you see in the night sky are multiple planet, double and multiple planet systems. So so it's the, it's not a, a question about a rare possibility, right? It's It's... Um, mo binary star systems are not rare in the night sky. So it's a very natural question to wonder whether they could also be repositories of, of yeah, habitable yeah. planets. Yeah, yeah. 70% of stars are in binaries indeed. And I have to add that there's another solution when the two stars are very far from each other, orbiting in, say, thousands of years or tens of thousands of years, and both of them host planets very close in. That's oh, so that's, that's the opposite of the other one, right? A yeah. planet orbiting far from the pair, and a yeah. pair is or orbiting far from each other, so they carry their own solar systems around themselves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can have wow. both. All right, Matt, what more questions do you have for our guest? Yeah, we got some great questions. Well, one of the, the one that I had loaded up from Christopher Stowe was has just been answered by you. It was about planets and stable orbits around binary systems, so you've covered that. And just so to be clear, when we talk about stable planets, it has nothing to do with their emotional state, just to be clear. <laughs> no, planets are notoriously unstable in many ways. They're, <laughs> it's the, they can are go they off orbitally, at any minute. Orbitally stable, yes. Okay. Yeah, they're always erupting uh, and at just short to notice. Be clear, an unstable planet can either fall into the host star or get kicked out. So that the, the orbit does not maintain itself around the host star. Yeah, yeah. those are the two solutions. And curiously, we see the effect of both. Um, the planets that fell in the star, they pollute the star. So you can detect elements due to, oh. due to planets oh. that fell in in the atmosphere of oh. stars and the planets that were kicked out. That's really amazing, I think, but they were detected through what we call microlensing. They are dark. We don't see them, but they go in front of roughly in front of a star and they lens the light of the star due to their gravity. And then you see the background star brightening up. And with this thing over a decade or two, they actually measured that there are roughly about 40 billion free-floating planets in our galaxy, like one-tenth the number of the stars. Of vagabond planets. Yeah, they have no stars. Wow. So if you know you're a, some weird civilization that somehow developed on such a planet because they have, say, radioactive heat coming from the planet, they would actually have a very different view of the universe. Like they don't have a central star. Right. They will, at one point, might discover there are even planets orbiting stars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what a concept, wow. right? Huh? Yeah, yeah, no, it's all, it's all, it must be all different. So the, the ancient Catholic Church was right. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, well, that, that, that does segue quite neatly, I think, into a question from Scott Bringlow from Canada. Captain Scott here says, with transits being the predominant method of exoplanet discovery, what characteristics of the exoplanet are you not able to identify using this method? 
and more importantly, what can you identify using this method? I find it fascinating you can glean so much info from what amounts to a very small dip in measurable light from light yeah. years away. Yeah, I guess we would compare this method to maybe direct me direct uh, imaging, for example. Let's compare those two together. Yeah, okay. So um, I'm, I'm fascinated by how much we can actually learn from a transiting exoplanet, and I think that's generally something is amazing about astrophysics that we have a lab which is infinitely far away compared to what we can reach and yet we can figure things out so the transit is i think the best example that you first of all from the dip the depth of the transit you can tell how big the planet is that's pretty obvious like if it's very deep then the planet is big compared to the star and if it's shallow then it's tiny because it's just blotting out light and it just blots out more light yeah, it's yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. simple. But um, you can also measure the period. You see how frequently you see these transits in front of the star, mm -hmm. and you can tell the orbital period of the planet. So these are easy, okay? Provided you kept monitoring it, so it's not just snapshots. You have to keep checking to wait for that to happen again, right? So that's entirely true. Yeah, that's entirely true. You need right, right. So, so there could be some transits where the orbit is like on a twenty-year period or something. Let's say. And we haven't seen it come back again, right? So yep. there's got to be some of those too. Yeah, there, there, there are some of those. And there are some where you have a transit and you miss the second one because it was daytime or whatever happened. Your spacecraft was oriented in a different direction. So there's all of these. But you measure the depth, you measure the period. Now, the other things that are sort of less trivial, but you can also tell um, how far the transit is off from the center line of the star. Does the planet go exactly along the line of sight, crossing the star along its diameter, or it's like slightly offset, or maybe it's even grazing? So you can tell this from the shape of the transit. I think that's sort of a, oh, wow. an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. You can also tell how so the far shape. The... But by the shape, you mean as the light begins to dim, it will dim at a certain rate. Yeah. And the rate at which that light dims tells you whether it crosses the middle or above yeah, or below the yeah. equator. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, naively, mm -hmm. if it's a grazing transit, the planet just barely goes in front of the limb of the star. You will see this very shallow, very uh, gradually fainting, barely fainting star. Whereas if it goes close to the equator of the star, you will see a sharp decrease in the, br in the brightness of the star. And, and the brightness will stay low until it's worked its way out again. Right. Yeah, Whereas if yeah. it's grazing, it'll just dip in and come back out. So, so uh, it's amazing what you can deduce from the, just the shape of that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now comes the the. So these are the what we call like geometric parameters, which you can figure out. It's not very complicated, but I think what's what's amazing is, for example, you can tell um, what's the angle. Bear with me between the planet's orbit and the spin of the star. So is it like a star spinning, say, the axis of the spin points exactly up in some coordinate system? And is the planet orbiting exactly perpendicular to that? Or is it somehow misaligned? You can tell this from combined observations of the light of the, of the transit and doing what we call radial velocities, like measuring mm -hmm. the, the red and blue shift of the star during the transit. Um, I mean, that's an amazing thing because in our own solar system, um, we are the sun is about seven degrees misaligned with respect to the, the Earth's orbit. orbital plane of the of the planets. But yeah, yeah. In, we, we discovered planets which orbit close in, like they orbit around their stars in two days. And the star is spinning exactly the opposite direction as the planet's orbit. So it's like upside down spinning and the planet is orbiting in the same direction as you would expect. Mm, mm, mm. Um and what else? I mean you can um Here's an interesting quiz if the planet is going in front of the star. And then during that transit, there's actually a spot on the star. Then for a short time instance, the planet will not be covering the star's bright surface, but the spot. So you will see a brightening in the middle of the transit. Ha. Wow. So you can, actually, you can actually scan the spots on a star using the planet going in front, which has been done. Mm. And, and Matt, the, our official term for spots on stars are called star spots. Ah, that's yeah, our official yeah. term. <laughs> and that stands and for that's solar, the most important thing. temporary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because sunspots, I mean, we didn't know what they were until long after they were named, but the name stuck. And they're dimmer than the surrounding wow. brightness of the star. So, that's, so, you, so your planet crosses the star and crosses a spot and so, because the spot plus the planet 
had a certain uh, brightness dimming, and then the planet covers the spot. And so now, I mean, and then the, the star brightens up a little bit because now the spot is not adding to the planet blockage. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And I left out the most, maybe most important one, um, which is measuring the atmosphere of the planet and the elements or molecules in the atmosphere. So what you can do is you take a spectrum of the star when the planet is not in front of it. So you take a spectrum, you see the starlight split into wavelengths, and from it's a very complicated spectrum. And from that, you can figure out what elements there are in the spectrum of that star. And then you take another one when the planet is blocking the star and the starlight is actually shining through the atmosphere of the planet. And the planet's atmosphere will be absorbing some of the starlight. If you compare the two, the spectrum of the star without the planet in front, and with the planet in front, you can tell what the atmosphere of the planet is made of. Wow. Um, and I think that's, you know, you can tell, okay, there is an atmosphere here which has water molecules in it, or it has sodium in it. These have or, been or if it has oxygen, that'd be kind of interesting because oxygen is not stable. And so something would be making that oxygen. And then yep, this, this, yep. Would be, these are, this would be your first indication, or at least your first hint of life, I guess. Yeah, so that's why I mentioned it, because exactly the, the, the best bet right now for a, what we call a biomarker is ozone and oxygen. Because if there's no life replenishing these, they would basically oxidize the planet. Right, so the right. planet would become big, red, and rusty instead of what it is. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and in, in this case, in Earth's case, it's the plant life that's making the oxygen, uh, not humans or any other animal life. So, Plus, you know, <laughs> in the first two billion years, we were not producing oxygen, we were producing methane. So this is not saying that if you see a planet with no oxygen, it has no life. We can't say that yet. Right, but, um, right. Exactly. It is one of one of our best. But if it bets. does have oxygen, that's a good bet. If you're that a betting a good person. Bet. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So um, I think the question also is what we cannot discover from this. Um, and um, I mean, the, the transit is such that Obviously, what's on the on the dark side of the planet facing towards us, um, we don't see any details. We can't resolve the planet. A, a transit will not resolve spatial features on this planet. There you go. Um, Whereas a not... direct imaging of one, the hope is one day we'll have enough resolution to actually see oceans or clouds yeah. or something on it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So the Very direct good. imaging is where you can actually see the planet directly. Um that's a separate Definitely. cottage industry that's un that's unfolding right now in our field. Yep. Yeah. 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 Matt, give me some more. See if we can fit yeah, in a well, few I'm more. Yeah, well, I'm going to I'm going to combine two we gotta, again because I've got plane. two good questions. You're such Love a combiner. It. You're such well, a combiner. this is also, you know, mm -hmm. uh, our, our expert here combines images from small telescopes and that's what this que these questions are about. Uh, David Lee's from uh, from Chiang Mai in Thailand says, uh, Dr. Bakosh, considering your specific interest in small telescopes and their application in your research, could you elaborate on the advantages and disadvantages of using these in exoplanet detection as compared to larger telescopes? And Jose Marcelino says, as someone inter interested in instrumentation, I'm curious on your perspective on the challenges and opportunities of using small telescopes for astronomical research. What are some unique advantages they offer? And also in the, in the like realm that. of extrasolar planets, what are some of the most intriguing findings or trends that have emerged in recent years? Are there any specific characteristics or planetary systems that have captured your attention? So I guess that's two, that's two questions from the second one. But for okay, and I want to try to get yet another question in after that. So, so Gaspar, see if you can answer that quickly. Yeah, yeah. This is this question. I would need a lecture on this. Basically, I will try to be <laughs> quick. Um, the trends are very quickly. First, most important, there's plenty of exoplanets. Essentially, every star has statistically an exoplanet. That's something that came out from the past twenty years. Second. The planets in the universe are very different from our own planets. They're, they're ones that are very strange. They're orbiting just a few days around their suns. They're orbiting the opposite direction as the star spin. Third, there are planets that are completely unexpected, like much bigger than Jupiter in mass, much, much bigger. There are planets that we don't have in the solar system that are between the mass of Earth and Neptune or Neptune and Saturn, all kinds of weird things. There are many eccentric planets, not nice circular orbits like in the solar system, but they go on these widely eccentric orbits. Um, and once again, the 
eccentric is not a psychological <laughs> state. You no, know, no, just yeah. To uh, um, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm on, I think um, we now know that small planets are far more frequent than big ones. We now have a handle on the frequency, the occurrence rate of planets. And we know that long period planets are also far more frequent than short period ones. This has been measured. It's not some rough, you know, we actually know the numbers. Um, I think those are the most important ones. And so the small telescope stuff, um, the charming thing is a small telescope is obviously much, much cheaper than a big one. And yet you can do a lot of science with it. And then big telescopes can selectively follow up on the gems that you found. So it's a much more optimal use of resources. Another thing is many people are capable of and many nations or say institutions who are not well funded are capable of running small telescopes. Or even students, student programs. Yeah, exactly. Right. But to run a space telescope, you know, where is the ten billion coming from? You know, <laughs> yeah. it, it, and a space money. agency and a yeah. <laughs> yeah. So any well, nation. So if the, I think the bottom line of that question is, how many stars of the night sky do your small telescopes have access to? Because the, if the star is too dim, you're not gonna, you can't do it. But where's a big telescope? can monitor a dim star. So how many stars, do you have enough work cut out for you? Yeah, so I'm just developing a new small telescope system, which will consist of 64 small telescopes in an array, each having its own detector. And it will see the whole sky above, you know, reasonable elevation of, about, above the horizon. And it will measure the brightness of about 100 million stars oh, every 30 20. seconds. <laughs> okay. Well, we're done here. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. well, then I th a hundred million every thirty. Well, we're good. You good? You good on that? Yeah, right. yeah. Well, then yeah, I think no. that leads quite neatly into. I, I think that if there's time for one final question, Troy from one more. Let's Troy from Virginia in. In says, uh, Doctor Bakosh, do you foresee the creation of a detection method that will expand our current model of the visible universe? Wow, Ooh. like a brand new one, other than Ooh, yeah. I mean, yeah. the latest one, which it was gravitational waves, which right? we. We have detected neutrinos, right? That was amazing. We do cosmic, we detect cosmic rays, particles directly coming from far away. We have electromagnetic radiation and we have gravitational waves. And um, just to be clear, each one of these requires a different kind of, quote, telescope to observe. Right. So yeah. the gravitational waves, that was LIGO. And then you have neutrino detectors. Those are underground vats. Of the, all right. And then you said electromagnetic. That would be traditional telescopes. And uh, is there anything left? I mean, what's left? Well, I think what's left is, for example, detecting dark matter. Through okay. Fancy so we don't know what dark matter is. Um, all we know is that it does not interact with electromagnetic radiation. That is light. Okay, so a dark matter detector. Why isn't that just detecting its gravity? Isn't that well? So we have detected its gravity um, through looking at the spin of galaxies or uh, the properties of galaxy clusters. I get it. Its effects, but not the thing itself. And we would like to see, like, yeah. what is it? Like, what's the particle? But yeah. the particle is really annoying <laughs> um, because it does not interact with anything. So, mm -hmm. and of course, the gravity of an individual particle you can't measure. You need big lumps of this dark matter to see. So. Um, that's sort of a new thing. I think that that's the one I would list for this. Otherwise, I guess improving the detection methods for all of these, having big space telescopes, large ground-based telescopes, clear skies all together will hugely improve our capabilities. I want you to take us out with just a a a a commercial for the Vera Rubin telescope and what that will do for the measurement of transient phenomena. And then you can wrap it in how bad the satellite trails would be in the face of those data. Yeah, so the, the Vera Rubin um, survey will um, will be commissioned next year, starting scanning the sky from Chile using a giant telescope. It has a mirror diameter of six and a half meters, and it will scan the sky every three, day, three, night, every three days, sort of, so it will constantly work every night, but every point in the sky will get an observation roughly every third uh, day. And it will see very deep down, very faint things. So it will be very rich with exploding things in the universe very far away. Now, having said that, it's an extremely sensitive telescope. So a satellite going through will it leads to this giant bright streak across the image, spoiling a big part of the image. Are you going to um, have to only use it 
outside of the twilight zone. Ooh, I like the way that came out. <laughs> okay, the evening twilight and morning twilight is where you get the reflection of the sun. So maybe the telescope would only be at its best between the two edges of twilight. Well, these twilights are very long. So there's a tone of that because of, for the satellites, what we call twilight is they're, they're orbiting further up at oh, 400 even kilometers. Up. So you can easily see them three, four hours after sunset and three, four hours before. And then you have the whole night already. So in a summer night, the whole night is twilight for mm. the satellites. Mm -hmm. In a winter night, there might be a couple of hours in the middle that is less. Fine. But you're losing majority of your time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if it repeats the sky every three nights, it can see... It should detect anything that varies on that kind of time scale. Is that a fair expectation for it? Yep, that is. That is a fair expectation. And it will see many things that, that change, either move asteroids or blow up supernovae mm -hmm. or dim, collapsing stars into a black hole or all oh. kinds of interesting things. Well, you convinced me. Let's shoot them down. Let's shoot these satellites down. <laughs> in a video game as a minimum as a, in a video game i mean you could with with lasers <laughs> that, that are used for um inter like used for adaptive optics i think if one hit a satellite i'm sure military has the technology of doing that if they really want to. <laughs> uh, so so gus well, when does your documentary come out dark sacred night um, that documentary was, um, it came out on the Garden State Film Festival and it, it even won a prize. I forgot what prize. Garden but... State is New Jersey for those yeah, who yeah, didn't know. Uh, um... Some people think of New Jersey as a garden. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's publicly available on YouTube. It's oh, it's just, available out. Okay. Right, we'll yeah, look yeah. Thank for, you. for a while, it was only through, you know, buying a ticket. <laughs> yeah, but cinema. thank you for, but, for highlighting that for me. But yes. now it's all open. Yeah. So I, I highly recommend. It's a short documentary. So it's um, mm -hmm. 10 minutes, maybe, or 15. It's... Okay. Well, guys, it's, it's been a delight to have you on Star Talk and share your expertise with us, uh, especially from my old stomping grounds of Peyton Hall on campus of Princeton University. Yeah, we miss you. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Excellent. And Matt, always good to have you, man. It's always good to be here. All right. This has been Cosmic Queries. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. As always, keep looking up. <laughs> <laughs>